Welcome to April here in New Jersey in zone 7A, formerly 6B. Today we are going to do a mid spring tour, but focused on short lived perennials. Now, when I was putting in these short lived perennials into the ground two falls ago, I had this question, which was if I kept them in the ground for an extra year, would they expedite their growth in terms of giving me earlier blooms? How would they look this time of year relative to year one overwintered short-lived perennials? Because I couldn't find that answer on YouTube, I decided to do it myself. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. And we're gonna break this tour into three buckets. We're gonna look at those short-lived perennials that have comparison, meaning I have some in the ground that are going onto year two for flowering. And I have some new seedlings that were put into the ground and overwintered last fall. So we're gonna look at a comparison to see the differences in growth. The second group that we're gonna look at is just the second year short-lived perennials that don't have a comparison point because I just didn't get seedlings in last fall. And the third group is actually one that I'm most excited about. It's lilies. Lilies, while they can be perennialized in ground where I live, they technically should not be able to be perennialized in crates, which is how I grow the majority of my lilies because I like to secession force them for a continuous bloom cycle. Now, I left crates outside. We get temperatures very, very low down to the teens sometimes. So they are subjected to freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing, which is not great for bulbs. And guess what? They made it, but we're gonna look at the comparison of bulbs that were left outside in crates versus crates that I pulled into the pole barn and those that were planted in a raised bed using what we call the lasagna method below tulips. So super exciting, and we'll talk about that in detail. Now, traditionally, May is my favorite month because that's when you see a lot of explosive growth happening in the flower field. What I am seeing is that with these second year short lived perennials, that explosive growth is happening right now in April. And that is because even though our nighttime temperatures are still dipping into the mid thirties and low forties, the daytime temperatures are warm enough to warm up the soil for growth. So you're gonna see a stark difference between the year one versus year two short lived perennials. Now, when I say short lived perennials, I'm really talking about some biennials that flower in year one because they're hybridized to do so and they can still put on blooms in year two. So that would be like Dianthus, Sweet William, as well as foxglove. I also have things like yarrow, feverfew, which are supposed to flower repeatedly, but sometimes they get tired over a few years and they're not going to put out as great blooms. So one of my other questions really is just, am I going to get more abundant blooms? Will I get the same quality of blooms, especially for something like yarrow, which over time the colors will tend to fade and you really want to rotate having newer yarrow seedlings in the ground. So all of this is really to inform me of just how long can I keep certain types of short living perennials in the ground. So besides those four that I just talked about, we're also gonna look at sea holly, which is a much longer living perennial and will establish. First up, we have foxglove. Now this is, I believe, foxy foxglove. And this is tremendous, tremendous growth for this time of year. I would say that this is probably the type of growth that I saw in mid-May last year. Now I'm gonna show you a comparison of what newer foxglove looks like. We are now in a different row where I did put in new foxglove last fall. So this was put in in I think early November and the growth is fine, but it is obviously nowhere near that foxglove that you just saw, which is in year two. Now, I obviously knew that a more established plant was going to put on more growth more quickly, but I didn't expect the stark difference. This is important because if you want to secession plant things like foxglove or other short-lived perennials, you might want to have something that has overwintered and then also put in something new and that will get you a more extended bloom time window. So I would expect that since I got foxglove last year sometime in like, like early June, mid June, that I would be getting foxglove sometime in late May, if not earlier June this year. And then the new foxglove is gonna give me some extra blooms to tie me into the end of June. Next up, we've got my favorite, which is yarrow. This is a row of yarrow with a little bit of lilies over here. I don't know why that happened, but we've got a lot of second year yarrow. And again, 
This is way, way more advanced in terms of the growth that it's put on during this time of year versus last year. I do have some newer yarrow that I moved in terms of clumps from this patch. So what I did was I divided these back in the fall and I put them over here and you can see that these are established, but certainly nowhere near the height as the second year yarrow. But these are looking really, really good. And these actually got chewed down a bit by, I think it was rabbits. So I'm excited to see that they're still coming back. And I'm hoping that by dividing this yarrow, I will still get uh, a range of vibrant colors that typically does not happen when you let yarrow go on for too long, like more than two years. I also want to show you some other yarrow that I got. This is a white double yarrow that I got from Cross Country Nurseries. I did a video on them when they were selling perennial flower transplants. So I got some from there. I think it's six of these. These were completely mowed down by rabbits when I first put in, but you can see they're pretty happy right now. I just have to weed out a little bit over here, but I'm hoping that I can divide this for next year because double white yarrow is really, really awesome. And I think it'll be super versatile in both retail and florist sales. Now, if you've been following me, you'll know how much I absolutely love yarrow. Yarrow was one of my most profitable crops from last year. I love the fact that it is native to where I am. It is native to a lot of parts of the United States. It comes in a variety of colors. So the series that I primarily grew last year was the Summer Berry series. It had a lot of sorbet-like colors, which made it super versatile in both florist and retail sales. And it also attracts a lot of beneficial insects. I mean, I saw a lot of lacewing, uh, as well as ladybugs on there. And I am now trying to expand where I put the yarrow into different parts of the flower field so that it can attract those beneficial insects. Typically, anything that has that spray-like umbrella-shaped form is good for attracting beneficial insects because it's really easy for those insects to access the nectar and the pollen that they need in order to get their energy source. In our final first bucket, where I show you a comparison of second year versus first year perennials, we're gonna talk about a much longer living perennial and that is sea holly. Sea holly has very, very long tap roots. You can actually see those roots within the first season. I was able to get flowers or I guess usable stems. I don't know if you can call them flowers, more like bracts, uh, off of first year flowering sea holly. I wouldn't say that there were a super profitable crop, but they were enough to make the make back the money of the seedlings and more. And this year I would definitely expect more vigorous growth. So let me show you where they are right now. I had some that naturally reseeded. So we're gonna use that as a comparison point for where they would have looked like right now if I had put in seedlings in last fall. So this is the sea holly row. We've got, I would say about 75, established plants in here. These are absolutely giant, especially relative to last year. This sea holly didn't look like this until definitely mid late May last year. So I'm super excited because they put on a tremendous amount of growth. If you saw my interplanting stock video, you'll have seen the amount of growth these put on in just two weeks. I think it's absolutely astounding. Now, I had a lot of sea holly reseed. I'm gonna have to thin these, if not take these completely out. You don't want them being too crowded uh, just because they will get pretty big, but you can see the size that these are at. And these definitely sprouted sometime in the late fall last year. So this is the, this is the state that they would look like right now if I had put in seedlings. Now, I think some of them did actually just sprout this spring, like this one over here. So you can get an idea for the stages that they would be at depending on where, on when you put them into the ground. The other thing to note here is that I have been experimenting with interplanting. So again, I interplanted stock here. This is a rose lily bulb that is popping up. I'm hoping to perennialize these rose lilies and have them come back year after year. So again, if you watch my stock video, you'll see that these have actually also started putting on a little bit more growth. The bottom leaves are a bit yellow, so I need to fertilize them, but overall they're doing pretty good. And there were a few comments about me starting the stock a little bit late, which is true if I were to have started them from seed, but I got these as plugs. And given the fact that we are hitting low 30s, including freezing next week, I actually feel really good about the timing that I put in 
for the stock because I don't think these ceilings would have done as well if I put them out in mid-March where we were consistently hitting mid-20s at night. So I feel like I'm giving the stock ample time to establish itself while the weather is still relatively cool and these are growing fast enough to help shade these out when the weather does get warmer especially at night. Now let's look at some of the second year perennials that I don't have a comparison for but I'm going to try to show you a photo of what they look like around this time last year. First up is Feverfew. Feverfew is a sore subject for me because I had to rip out the majority of my Feverfew last year since I had a major thrips infestation that basically overtook all my Feverfew. But I wanted to keep some of the single magic series. And so what I did was I actually transplanted them from one part of the field to another. And this is what these transplants look like. I transplanted them back in the fall. So they are technically in their second year, but they had established themselves in a new space. Here is the fever few. They are so bushy. It's really crazy just how much growth they've put on in a short amount of time. Because if I were to show you a picture of this two weeks ago, it was like half the size. So these are way ahead relative to last year, no surprise. And this is all that I kept. So Feverfew is multi-stemming. You'll get a lot of stems off of a single plant. I still think because I am not having any biological control over the thrips that they still might have thrips. So I didn't put in a ton of Feverfew, but I wanted to see how these would do purely from a growth perspective. And these also attract, attract a lot of beneficial insects such as ladybugs. So just having them here is also a bonus from that regard. The second crop I wanted to show you in this category is Sweet William. This is first year flowering Sweet William. I got a ton of stems off of these. They were lifesavers for Mother's Day, which is around mid-May for us in the United States. And again, these are way ahead of schedule relative to last year. So this is second year Dianthus and they look really, really healthy. I have two patches of this. I had a lot more Sweet William before, but I ripped them out because I was shrinking my grow space. So here's another small patch. And then I have a final patch over here where there's clover as well as some other grasses in here, but they seem to still be doing well despite all of this. So you can see that there's already the formation of the flowers that is starting to happen. And I am hoping that I'll be able to get these for Mother's Day in about three weeks. Now it's time to move on to the third section of our tour, which is lilies. Lilies are my second biggest crop. My first biggest crop is tulips, primarily because I force so many during the winter season, but I love lilies because they are a programmable crop and I can have a focal that is reliable throughout the entire growing season. Hypothetically, I could grow lilies anytime throughout the year. I just don't have the space in my basement to grow them indoors during the winter. Lilies are not frost tolerant. They do not like the cold. So this is why this is so surprising that I have more than I expected in terms of the number of lilies that are popping up. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This here is Lily Row, and I know it's a little bit disheveled. All of these are newer lilies over here that I planted with new bulbs. But when we get to over here, these are all lilies from last year. So this crate over here, as well as these two, are actually lilies that I kept outside which is astounding again, because we get to pretty low temperatures. So what this means is that if you are forcing lilies like me, you could potentially overwinter your last succession by just leaving them outside. So what you would do is you would cut them at, at you know, the base over here, allowing some leaves to still be on there so that the bulb can photosynthesize and regenerate. Uh, I didn't even leave that much. They usually say you want to leave at least a third of the stem. I probably realistically left about maybe four sets of leaves at most. And they didn't even have a ton of time to regenerate because it was like late October when I cut these down. But you can see these are doing so well. So this crate specifically I brought into the pole barn where it was warmer. So the growth was re-triggered a lot faster than 
crate like this, which was left outside. Now I have many other crates that were left outside, including all of this over here. And they just regenerated growth and they are, they are shooting up. So I think that for a thin stem like this, I'm not going to count on a bud, but on a stem like this, I am certainly counting on a bud. So because of that, I have way, way more lilies than I thought I would at this point, which is fine because lilies do really well retail and I am trying to get florists to also use them more in their design work. And most of these along this row are non-fragrant lilies. Now, I also had some lilies that were put into the ground. So these are typical perennializing lilies. So again, if you saw my stock video, you'll have remembered that these were barely shoots that were peeking up. And that was about two weeks ago. So I'm finding it interesting that certain lilies feel like that they grow really, really fast relative to others. All of these lilies were put into the ground at the same time. Some of them gave me flowers, some of them didn't because it was too hot. So there was bud abortion. I didn't water them properly, but I left them all in because I wanted them to come back again. And this is what they look like. So I would expect these, because these are OT hybrids, they have a longer days to maturity, that these would be ready probably sometime in late June for me. And I've got a bunch of double OT hybrids, which are basically rose lilies. So I am super, super excited for that. Before I show you the lasagna planted lilies and the success with that experiment, I do wanna talk about having lilies as a reliable focal. So I said that I love them because I can basically grow them throughout the entire year. In order to achieve that, you have to order in bulbs from a lily supplier or distributor and you succession plant those bulbs. So those bulbs are coming in directly from being thawed from the cooler or the freezer in this case. So they think that it's winter. You basically have to mimic spring-like conditions while they're rooting and then you provide them with more warm temperatures while they're growing and then they will basically flower for you. So harder to achieve in the summer because it gets really, really hot, but still doable. What, what ends up happening for me is I just get shorter stems, but the stems are still like 16, 18 inches. When you have lilies that are grown during the most opportune time, like the spring, they get to be like three, four feet tall, which is more than what you need. Like no one needs a four foot tall lily unless if you're doing a specific event work. So for the most part, I find that even the shorter stem length in the summer is totally fine. Now the problem with growing lilies and doing it in shorter quantities is that it's hard to find a supplier that's gonna sell you fairly priced bulbs that are adequate for you to make a profit without perennializing them. So typically when you're ordering lilies, you're ordering them in wholesale quantities of 300 to 400 each. And even at my scale right now, I do not need 300 or 400 of a very specific variety and color. That's really hard for me to push. So instead, I have been ordering crates and then reselling those bulbs. And my goal is to beat the current folks out there who are selling in bunches of 25. I've rarely seen people offer them in sets of 50. So if you're interested in growing lilies, you can hop on over to my website. If you sign up, you get 10% off on your first order. And if they work out for you, then you can succession plant lilies like me and have a reliable focal throughout the entire season. You can also perennialize these lilies, like I'm saying, the only caveat is that they're all gonna pop up around the same time, kind of like what I'm dealing with right now, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You can of course just enjoy the lilies out in the field without selling them, which is probably what I will do for some of them, but you can probably get two good flushes out of them before you do something else with the bulb and that makes that a very, very profitable crop. All right, so I feel like I've been hyping up this lasagna planting lily experiment and here it is. So just a week ago, I was pulling out tulip stems and you can see there's still a laggard Columbus in here, probably really short. So this is a shorter stem. I'll keep this for myself. But the point is that I had about 750 lilies in this bed. This is a 17 foot bed here. So obviously a bit of an overkill for doing tulips, even through the no dig method. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to utilize this vertical space. And back in the fall when I was planting, or sorry, back in the summer when I was planting these lilies, because these lilies went in during mid August, 
I said to myself, what if I planted lilies in the first layer? So I basically filled up the soil up to here and I planted the lily bulbs. And then I said, when they're done, which is sometime in mid to late October, I am then going to fill it up with a little bit more soil, cut down the stems, dump the tulip bulbs on top, and then put some mulch as well as a lot of leaves on top and see if I can get two crops out of this bed within a short period of time. This is a concept known as relay cropping. I see this more in the vegetable world. It's a very hard concept to nail down, but when done correctly, what it does is it basically shortens your days to maturity for your second crop. So typically when we think about intensive farming, we're thinking about flipping a bed as quickly as possible turning it and then putting in new seedlings when that first crop is done. In relay cropping, your second crop is put in a lot earlier. So that way when the first crop turns over, the second crop is well on its way and you're shaving off the days to maturity. So in this case, the lily started popping up when the tulips were already, I would say like yay high. So the tulips had another like two to three weeks left before they were being pulled out and the lilies were coming up and they were being protected by the tulips, meaning that it was still getting really cold at night, freezing, where typically a lily would not be able to withstand those temperatures, but they were protected by the canopy of the tulips. And once I brought out those tulips, now you have the space for these lilies to basically grow and thrive. And you can see these are really, really far along compared to those in the crates and in the ground. This is my dog who wants to fetch right now. So as an example, this is a crate of a really popular OT hybrid called Zelmira. It's like a peach one. This one is at this stage right now. And I think that if these were in a raised bed like that, where it was under the protection of those tulips, they would be much, much further along. So I am super excited for this because I think that I'm going to get these lilies probably by early June at the latest. So that's a really good time for me to have flowers because I'll have a lot of other flowers at that time. I wanna show you a second bed over here. Again, more lilies, a bit of intercropping here because I intercrop anemones in here. And this is a bit of an accidental experiment, but I love this because the anemones were started late by me. I started these in December. I didn't get corns until December. So next year I'm gonna start them a little bit earlier, but, you can see that they are flowering. And I think that the stems are actually a little bit longer than what they would be because there is a canopy of lilies that's helping shade them out during the really, really sunny days. We have had a few days that got up close to 70s. And I think that the canopy is helping these anemones stay cool. So these stems are a lot longer for first flowering stems than in the field where I'll show you there are a couple of other anemones growing. But again, look at how well these lilies are growing. And I would say that these lilies are a little bit behind the lilies over there, again, because they didn't have the canopy of the tulips to help them. These are newer lilies over here that I just planted in. Just to give you a quick comparison, this is what a field grown anemone looks like right now. The stem is really, really short. I'm gonna put shade cloth over this to try to extend its bloom window. Um, and there's a lot of paneling around here because I'm trying to smother out the weeds. But you can see like really good leaf growth over here. I actually haven't even fertilized these. The soil here is really, really good because we've been doing a lot to increase the soil life. I've buried food waste under here. This was actually a dahlia bed before. Um, so I don't think fertilization is the issue, but I need to put on shade cloth to make sure that it doesn't get too hot too quickly. Isn't that incredible how second year producing flowers could be so far along? If I could have, I would have put in a lot of witties and perennials around me. I mean, we have a lot of land. The problem is we have very, very bad deer pressure here. The deer literally eat everything that they're not supposed to, except for things like mints and daffodils. But one of my priorities this year is to figure out how to put in woodies and perennials and protect them from the deer. Over the past year and a half, we've been doing a lot of work on this property. In fact, that pole barn that you see behind me is actually completely new. So we were working on that. We had a septic project. We've been clearing the, the tree line behind me. So I think now that we've gotten all that out of the way, I can focus a little bit more of my efforts on 
things that will come back year after year because at the end of the day, these short-lived perennials are not going to do that. But in the meantime, I'm just so glad that I didn't have to put in the extra effort of either growing something from seed or spending the money to buy them in as plugs and overwintering them for the fall and instead rely on the work that I put in once two years ago to have productivity come back at least for a second year. So I'm super excited to share with you on how those bloom. But one thing that we did not cover in this tour was all of the other seedlings, the new seedlings that went into the ground over the past couple of weeks. I've put in at least a thousand, maybe a thousand two hundred seedlings into the ground. I've been focusing a lot more on filler this year, but we also have things like scoop scabiosa plugs that came in, which something in here really likes to eat. So we'll talk about that in a different video. I also have lisianthus trays and just some other stuff that I'm, I've put into the ground. So I didn't show that in this video because those seedlings are super, super small. I wanna show that to you in May when they've put on a bit more growth. But in the meantime, before that video comes out, if you are interested in some other spring related videos, I have a lot up here in a playlist. So be sure to check that out and I will see you in the next video.